The Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumble against him. I love that verse. I love that verse because I see myself in it. I am a grumbly person. I know you saintly people uh, rarely grumble, but I can be a grumbly person. So maybe you're not grumbly people, but I am a grumbly person. I don't always publicly grumble, but in the confines of my own home or car, I know how to grumble. And I have to confess, I have felt pretty grumbly this past week. Has anybody else felt that way? Maybe I'm alone. I might be the only one. Uh, so other people feel a little grumbly too? Good. Thank you. I don't feel so alone right now. You know, my summer vacation is over, and now I have to return to the morning rush of school drop-off. Grumble, grumble. God, why is it either blisteringly hot or pouring down rain all the time? Grumble, grumble. But the biggest reason I felt grumbly this week has to do with something I didn't even know existed until a week ago. The Delta variant. Sounds like something out of Star Trek. Hospitals filling up, masks coming back, plans getting dashed. Grumble, grumble, grumble. My complaint could be summed up this way. Why did we go through all that to end up here? The past year and a half of lockdowns and mask ups, quarantines and vaccines. What was it all for? And finally, just as we thought the pandemic was ending, it feels like we're quickly heading back to where we started. To quote the memorable Yogi Berra, it's deja vu all over again. Grumble, grumble, grumble. Why did we go through all that to end up here? Well, if there are any other grumblers out there this morning like me, this morning I have some good news for you. God's grace is the best medicine for a grumbling spirit. God's grace is the best medicine for a grumbling spirit. That's the central message behind our readings this morning. The complaint in our reading from Exodus is much like my own. Why did we go through all that to end up here? The Israelites have followed Moses and Aaron out of Egypt, out of the fertile land of the Nile River Delta, and they followed him into the Sinai Peninsula a dry desert wasteland. This is a little bit, this is a picture actually of the wilderness of sin, which we're going to talk about in just a second. It looks like this. And as, as the desert stretches before them, their tummies start to rumble and they start to grumble. They start to think about all that they had gone through just to wind up there in this desert wasteland. You may not remember everything the Israelites have been through at this point, so I just want to very briefly remind you of what the Israelites have gone through. The Israelites were living as slaves in Egypt, and not only were they forced labor for Pharaoh's building projects, but then Pharaoh starts systematically murdering their male children. And so the Israelites cry out to God for mercy, and he sends Moses when Moses shows up in the courts of Pharaoh, God starts performing all of these amazing signs and wonders. In fact, he does all these signs and wonders so that he's get, trying to get Pharaoh to release his people. He sends 10 plagues against the Egyptians, culminating in the death of the firstborn of all of Egypt, including Pharaoh's own son. And so finally, finally, after all these plagues, all these miraculous signs and wonders, finally, Pharaoh relents and releases God's people. Not only do the Israelites miraculously gain their freedom, but as they're leaving Egypt, the Egyptians pay them reparations. They load up their carts with silver, gold, jewelry, and clothing. They start giving them all this stuff. 
to pay them back for what was taken from them. Except, just as the Israelites are getting to the very edge of Egyptian territory, what does Pharaoh do? You know the story? He changes his mind, and he sends his army to go get the people. So here's God's people. They're they're standing on the shores of the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army is pressing down upon them, getting ready to slaughter them for all they know, and they are trapped. But again, after all the signs and wonders he did, again, God miraculously intervenes and leads them through the Red Sea on dry ground. Pharaoh's army isn't so fortunate, they get swallowed up by the sea. The Israelites have gone through all of this, enough experiences to fill many lifetimes. They've gone through all of this just to come to the barren wasteland, the wilderness of sin. So this is the context for this morning's reading. They've been traveling in the desert for about a month now when they arrive in the wilderness of sin. Isn't that a great name, by the way? The wilderness of sin. It's it's a little uh, on-the-nose ironic. Um, (laughs) So Exodus 16.1 We didn't have this verse in our reading, but I want to just read to you because it gives the context. So they they set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. So here is a map just to show you how far they've traveled. So if you look at the map, they started way up there in Goshen. You can see I don't know if you can see this, but there's a they're part of the Nile River Delta. You can see the streams of water flowing right where they were. They travel all the way down. They cross the Red Sea, and they're heading south down the Sinai Peninsula until they get to the Desert of Sin. The Desert of Sin. And the people, they're, they're standing there in this complete wasteland. And again, I don't know if we have that picture again to show you what it looks like. They're standing here. This is what they're looking out at. They're looking out at this. And here's what they say. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. You know, we say hindsight is twenty twenty. But often, hindsight is through rose-tinted glasses. Remember their circumstances back in Egypt? Do you remember how I described it for you? Forced labor, constant racial discrimination, their male children being slaughtered at birth. From the way they're talking about it in the wilderness of sin, you might think they were relaxing poolside in the courts of Pharaoh, enjoying themselves when they were back in Egypt. We can do the same thing. We can forget how bad off we were before God intervened in our lives. We can forget the grace of God. So the first thing I want to tell you this morning, the first lesson that we get out of this story is that we need to remember God's grace when we are tempted to grumble. Remember, God had done all these crazy miracles to provide for them and take care of them. But now they have totally lost sight of that. They have become disconnected from reality and filled with distrust for their leaders. Distrust really for the Lord. The Israelites do not express any gratitude for God and they're grumbling. You didn't hear that in there. Well, we really appreciate you delivering us out of slavery and saving our male children. But, you know, we're a little hungry. That's not what they say, is it? They say, you brought us out here to kill us, didn't you? That was your plan. The Israelites do not express any gratitude in their grumbling. Billy Graham once said this. He said, grumbling and gratitude are for the child of God in conflict. Be grateful and you won't grumble. Grumble and you won't be grateful. It's such a good word. But I want to be careful with this because I think we need to distinguish grumbling from ordinary, run-of-the-mill complaining. Our psalm is really helpful in the insight it gives into what was happening in the hearts of the Israelites. Um, This is a little bit of a different version, but I think it gets it a little better. It says, Yet they sinned still more against him, 
rebelling against the Most High in the desert, right? It wasn't that they were just complaining to God. They were rebelling against the Most High in the desert. And they, they tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. Grumbling is not the same as complaining. It's not the same as lament when we grieve and mourn over sad or difficult circumstances. In fact, Jesus tells us to mourn with those who mourn, right? So we can mourn, we can be sad, we can be grieved. In fact, there's an entire book of the Bible called Lamentations, right? So we can be sad, we can be distressed, we can bring our emotions to God. Grumbling is not that. Grumbling is when we impute bad motives to God or others. Notice what the Israelites said. You have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger, as if that was their purpose. So that's grumbling at its core. Grumbling is also not just asking. It's not the same as asking for something. We can ask God for anything, anytime. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. God has no problem with us asking him for stuff. He, he commands us to ask him for stuff. He wants us to come, with, come to him when we need help. Jesus says that God's like, like a good father who, when his children come to him for help and ask him for something, he's delighted to give it to them. That's what he says God is like. Grumbling is different. Grumbling is when we start to make demands. It's when we say, give me this or else. It's when we make demands of God as if we were his masters. Think of grumbling like this. When we start with what we think we deserve instead of what we know we don't deserve, we grumble. I'm going to say that again because I know it's a long sentence there. When we start with what we think we deserve instead of what we know that we don't deserve, we grumble. And this has tripped me up over and over and over again in my life. I start with what I think I deserve instead of what I know I don't deserve. That's what happened with the Israelites. If the Lord wanted to kill them, they say, they at least deserve to die with a full belly, right? They at least deserve bread and meat pots, whatever those are. I have no idea what a meat pot is, but probably something good, something delicious. The Israelites have lost sight of gratitude and embraced grumbling. And when we start with gratitude for all we have that we don't deserve in our lives, it radically changes our perspective. When we start thinking about all the things we've received in our lives that we don't deserve from the Lord, it changes our perspective. This is something I'm really trying to grow in. I have a long way to go. I have not arrived. I'm still a grumbly person. But I want to encourage you. I recently heard about a technique that's used when someone is spiraling out of control. Uh, it's, it's a really uh, effective way to get, like if a kid is having a temper tantrum, it's something you can do with them. And it says, it's just five things you can see. You have to name five things they can see, four things they can touch, three things they can hear, two things they can smell, and one thing they can taste. And it helps kind of reconnect the person in crisis back to reality. And as, as I thought about that, and as I was kind of learning about this, and I, by the way, it does work. I've used it on, on someone else, and it worked. Uh, my, maybe I'm using it on myself this week. But anyways, um, it works. And I started to think about it. I thought, you know, that's what we need spiritually. We need something spiritual that will reconnect us to reality. Spiritually, we need to be reconnected to reality when we're spiraling into a grumbling mess. And I remembered something that my spiritual director had me do as an exercise where he had me write down five signs of God's grace towards me to reconnect me to reality. Grace just means, when I say signs of grace, I know that can be kind of a weird theological word we don't really understand, but grace just means favor. It means unmerited, unearned favor, something God gives you that you didn't earn. And for Christians, the big grace that we receive is Jesus dying on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. But life is full of little graces in addition to that. 
all sorts of things that God gives us that we don't deserve. And basically, what, what my spiritual director was telling me was to count my blessings, to cultivate gratitude in my heart. So in this past week of grumbling, I, I've started to pick up this practice. I can, I've got a little journal, and I've been writing in it. Let's see if I can find what I wrote this morning. So this morning, it's really simple. Here we go. I wrote down brownies. I'm grateful for brownies. My mom's in town. She made my favorite brownies last night. Delayed rain. There's some yard chores that I wanted to do, and the rain's getting delayed today. A reliable car. When I got in my car this morning, it started right up, and I got to work. Kids that still cuddle. That's a big one for me. All right, maybe you don't cuddle your kids. I cuddle my kids. Time with Megan. Megan and I had a little time to connect yesterday. So I start my day with just a little list, five things of gratitude. Man, is it helping me. Man, is it helping me this week. I just, I don't know why I shared that, but there it is. That's something that's helping me. It changes our perspective. Changes our perspective when we start with an attitude of gratitude. And you know, our, our children can help us, with, help us with this. My son, Luke, is so good. He, he, every night in our prayers, he always has this attitude of gratitude in his prayers that we do. And things that I wouldn't even think of or might overlook. You know, he's, he's in there, he's like expressing gratitude for his favorite blanket, you know, a Band-Aid that he got for a boo-boo, things that I wouldn't even think of. He thinks of, he sees as God's grace to him. So the first thing is we remember God's grace. That, that helps us when we're in a grumbling spirit. We remember God's grace for us. Second, we look for God's face. I want to remind you of exactly what is happening as the Israelites are grumbling. As they are grumbling, at that very moment, a miraculous cloud is hovering above their heads protecting them from the blistering desert sun. We didn't have that in our reading, but in the chapter before, God has this cloud that's shadowing them in the desert. So not only did the Lord miraculously intervene when they were back in Egypt, not only did he help them cross the Red Sea, not only did just a few days previous did he provide them with water, but right at that moment, while they're grumbling, there is a cloud above their heads, sheltering them from the sun. As our psalm said, in the daytime, he led them with a cloud and all the night with a fiery light. Moses didn't lead them in the desert. Every step of the way, God in this cloud and pillar of fire at night is leading them through the desert, protecting them from the sun, lighting up the night so that they're safe from predators. But the Israelites have lost complete sight of God. They aren't even aware that they are grumbling against the Lord. They have taken the Lord completely out of the equation. That's why twice Moses tells the people, your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. We're not the ones leading you. We're not the ones in charge here. The Lord's in charge here. Look at how the Lord responds. Look at how the Lord responds to this grumbling people. God's response to grumbling is always grace. Listen to this. I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. And in the evening quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? By the way, that's what manna means. It's Hebrew for, what is it? So they started calling it manna. We don't know what this is. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. God gives them bread and meat in the barren wilderness. That's the grace of the Lord. Their grumbling hearts, their grumbling minds, he gives them bread in the wilderness. But notice and this is the critical part I want you to notice, that his whole goal in providing bread from heaven is so that you shall know that I am the Lord your God. The whole reason that he responds to their grumbling with grace is so that they would get acquainted with him, that they would know him. They become familiar with who he is, his character. That God is a God who extends grace to our grumbling souls so that we could be in relationship with him, that we would see him and know him. And so when we're tempted to grumble, or maybe we've already started grumbling, 
we need to look for God's face. We need to shift our gaze and look for God's face. That's what Jesus is saying in our gospel reading. Yeah, so our gospel reading is kind of moving forward along. We had the feeding of the 5,000 two weeks ago. Then last Sunday, if you recall, Jesus goes walking out onto the water as the disciples are straining against the oars. And so that crowd that he fed, the 5,000 plus, plus women and children, has now made it across on boats to the lake, chasing after Jesus. And so as they pursue him, they come up to him and they ask him, you know, when did you get here? You know, we, we, you disappeared on us. We've been looking for you. And Jesus, just as he does so well, he cuts right to the heart of the matter. Jesus says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. What Jesus is saying here, and I don't have time to unpack the whole passage. You're probably thankful for that, that I'm not going to do that. But, but, but what he's saying here that connects with our Old Testament passages you missed the signpost. You weren't supposed to just get some bread. You weren't supposed to think, oh, I'm a cool miracle worker. You were supposed to get to know me. It was supposed to be a signpost pointing you to my identity, that you'd know me. And here's, here's a clear indication that they're not getting. They say to him, what work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. That's what we heard in Exodus, right? Moses gave the people bread from heaven to eat. That's what it said? You guys paying attention? Is that what it said? Did Moses give them bread? No, who gave them bread? God gave them bread. And so Jesus says to them, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus says, it's me. It, it's me. It's, it's always been about me. It's been about me revealing myself to you. A more literal translation of what Jesus said would be something like this. It was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father is giving you, right now, the true bread from heaven. It isn't about what God had done in multiplying the loaves and fish. It wasn't about God raining down bread in the wilderness. It's about what God is doing in Jesus, that he is giving himself to his people. He's offering himself to people for relationship. The real feeding of the 5,000 is in Jesus. Jesus is the miraculous provision of bread. It's what the manna in the wilderness was supposed to foreshadow, that God cares for his people so much he will provide for their needs. He will give to them even his own life. New Testament scholar Rod Whitaker writes this way. He says, Jesus did not come to fill stomachs with food, but to fill lives with the very presence of God. He came to fill our lives with his presence. He came to be in relationship with us. Brothers and sisters, cause for grumbling is going to come in the weeks and months ahead. You are going to have many reasons to grumble. We all will. Let's remember God's grace and look for God's face. I want to encourage you to remember God's grace. You know, maybe you want to start writing down those three or four or five things each day to be grateful for. Ways that God has intervened in your life. Make a memory of them. Little signs of God's grace. And second, look for God's face. Instead of grumbling... Turn it into an occasion for prayer, a time to ask God, to see God as actually present in the situation. Don't be like the Israelites who miss the cloud above their heads. The Lord is hovering around you every moment of every day. He is with you always. So you can say in any situation, okay, God, what are you up to here? Or, or this is what I need. How are you going to take care of me? That's not presumptuous. The Lord loves you. He wants to take care of you. It's a way to bring God into every circumstance instead of forgetting that he's right there to meet every need. Martin Luther, the great reformer, he once said this, faith is a matter of personal pronouns. Bring God into your personal, everyday moments of grumbling. When you're starting to be tempted to grumble, when you've already started grumbling, invite God into that situation and say, okay, Lord, I know you're here. How are you going to help me? What do I need to see? What do I need to do? How can you help change my perspective? 
The only cure for a grumbling spirit is the grace of God. And so as we come to communion, we're reminded of God's grace. Communion is a visible sign of God's invisible grace. That's what we believe. It's a way that God's reminding us that he provides for us, that Jesus has already provided everything we need for eternal life. He cares for us so much that he gave his life for us. And so we can come with our messed up, rumbling hearts, our rumbling tummies. We can come to him with our, with our hands extended, grumbling and rumbling, ready to receive the bread of life. We come remembering God's grace this morning, remembering his grace to us and looking for his face. Amen.